This is day 12 of reading Revelation. Then I looked, and there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of rushing water or a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. They were singing what seemed to be a new hymn before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn this hymn except the 144,000 who had been ransomed from the earth. These are they who were not defiled with women. They are virgins, and these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They have been ransomed as the first fruits of the human race for God and the Lamb. On their lips no deceit has been found. They are unblemished. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead with everlasting good news to announce to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for his time has come to sit in judgment. Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. A second angel followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great that made all the nations drink the wine of her licentious passion. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, Anyone who worships the beast or its image or accepts its mark on forehead or hand will also drink the wine of God's fury, poured full strength into the cup of his wrath, and will be tormented in burning sulfur before the holy angels and before the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them will rise forever and ever, and there will be no relief day or night for those who worship the beast or its image or accept the mark of its name. Here is what sustains the holy ones who keep God's commandments and their faith in Jesus. I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, said the Spirit, let them find rest from their labors, for their works accompany them. Then I looked and there was a, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud one who looked like a son of man, with a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple, crying out in a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap the harvest, for the time to reap has come, because the earth's harvest is ripe. So the one who was sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, who also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel came from the altar, who was in charge of the fire, and cried out in a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Use your sharp sickle, and cut the clusters from the earth's vines, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth, and cut the earth's vintage. He threw it into the great winepress of God's fury. The winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood poured out of the winepress to the height of a horse's bridle for 200 miles. Today we have another vision of the glory of God and of a very large number of people with God and worshiping God. There's mention of everlasting good news, but to any reasonable reader of this, it doesn't sound like it's very happy news. Clearly, the message is that not everything is okay, but maybe, just maybe, hidden in there is the message that the option to worship is open to all. Maybe even in the midst of the troubles of this world, and uh, the hardships that we face, the option to worship God, to be present with God, is never foreclosed for any of us, and that surely would be good news. Also in this probably is something about the judgment of the world's brokenness and oppression. Clearly, part of what all Christians are called to do is be prophetic in that sense, to name what they see around them as sin, what they see as the imperfection of the world, the way in which the ways of this world exploit and dis disenable, disenfranchise people from being fully the creatures God intends them to be. 
We also have some interesting harvest images this time. There's wheat, grain, uh, and also grapes. And anyone who is Christian, who is accustomed to the images that we use around the Eucharist, must surely see in that some echo of the, the Last Supper, the continuing presence of Jesus with us in bread and in wine. And the grapes continue with the, the grapes of wrath, clearly something that has been a powerful image for artists down the centuries. Certainly it was there in Julia Ward Howe's idea of uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. John Steinbeck also named one of his novels, The Grapes of Wrath. And in both cases, there appears to be a kind of reckoning happening, a kind of settling of divine scores where God comes into places where injustice appears to have been tolerated or at least appears to have gone on unstopped for a while and alters events dramatically, whether in the form of uh, military power to right uh, the oppression of people or the, the way the elements may come back to bite us if we are heedless of God's plan for the universe and our in, intended role in the stewardship of it. So there is justice being enacted. That certainly is a theme all the way through Revelation, and it's pretty clear here. Also very important to note in this day's reading is the first mention of Babylon. This is something that has preoccupied interpreters of Revelation down through the centuries. They certainly have tried at various times in history to identify who or what Babylon is supposed to be. In the early centuries, Babylon was thought to be the Roman Empire. Later on, it was thought to be the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, more recently, uh, some evangelical viewers in the United States have assumed that Babylon was the Soviet Union or was the United Nations or was, was any number of other things that they saw as an oppressive and, and larger power in the world. Clearly, Babylon has some religious meaning, some political meaning, and some economic meaning, and we should not overlook any of those. But more generally, I think what we're being pointed toward here is the, the distinction between the worldly and the spiritual, and the way that the worldly can oppress the spiritual and can interfere with the free exercise of the worship of God and the, the faithfulness and loyalty to God that all of God's creatures are called to express. It is telling us something about how the followers of Jesus should live, and that will continue right on through the next couple of chapters of Revelation. Even in images that appear to be condemning one way of life, we see hints about what an alternative might be, and so perhaps what images of our life we are supposed to be gleaning from what we read. However, I do think, and I've said this before, I'll probably say it again as we go through the remainder of the book, that it's probably wise not to be too precise. Those who thought Babylon was Rome uh, probably would be surprised to find out now, 2,000 years later, how little power Rome has. I think we might be tempted in naming something or someone as being Babylon, as being the, the, the source of all evil, to overlook the version of Babylon that is in each one of us and that is in the local conditions and practices of all of us. Babylon is not to be ruled out of anyone's life or anyone's circumstances. We all are able to behave in ways that are uh, troubling to God and indeed should be troubling to our own souls if we will only stop and recognize it. So although we begin to hear about Babylon, we should not imagine that that is those people, but is in also some way ourselves in our worst moments. Tafasil, Benzia, Herezer, Dan, Way, 